Lift up, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Bible Speaks Live. Once again, coming to you with a word that we pray will be beneficial and helpful to your Christian life. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is able to help you. He alone is the answer to all that you seek, to all that you need in your life. He alone is the answer. We are streaming live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, and also on our podcast platform. That is Spreaker.com. We are here every Tuesday night at this time with the word that we pray is from the Lord. We believe is from the Lord. And we pray, uh, if you are watching on Facebook, that you will share this page with someone. Uh, just to let them know that the Bible Speaks Live is on the air, live and in color. And we pray that you'll be blessed tonight as you as you sit back and listen in for a bit to what the Lord has to say to you. Amen. So we once again, we want to thank those who do listen in on Spreaker.com. Once again, our, pod class, our podcast platform, uh, who do listen in faithfully, and they listen in from across the United States and around the world. We thank all of those in these particular cities and countries uh, that do take the time out to, to hear our program. So once again, uh, you can also join us on Spreaker.com, and you can go also go over to our YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to our channel there, and I'm sure uh, that you will uh, be blessed. Amen. We are currently in a study, uh, in a study entitled, uh, we are currently in a study uh, from the book of Revelation, entitled, uh, The Measuring Stick, Lessons from the Seven Letters. What can we glean from the seven letters that we see in the book of Revelation in the first uh, chapter number two and chapter number three? There is much, there is much to be taken out of these letters. And since we, since we have already gone over the fact that the... Jesus is speaking to the pastors of the church. It is essential that we understand that Jesus has much to say to the church, the church at large. Uh, if you look at all seven letters, you will find a profile of your particular church. You will find a profile maybe of individuals, maybe of yourself or a combination uh, of many. Uh, you will find it here in these seven letters. And so it's very important that we understand uh, the meaning behind uh, these words, these very important words in the book of Revelation. We are currently uh, about to speak about the third, the third letter, which is the church in Pergamos, the church in Pergamos. And they, uh, they had their problems. They had their problems. And we're going to get right into it as soon as we pray right now. Lord, we bless you. We thank you once again. You have allowed us to be in your presence. We pray that you will be with us as we open up your word once again, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray you will give us grace, that you would open up the hearts and minds of those who hear and those who watch. Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that you might cause them to see and cause eyes to be opened, even tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we bless the Lord once again. Revelation chapter number two. Revelation chapter number two. And we are reading from, starting in verse number 12. Revelation chapter number two, starting in verse number 12. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Amen. Once again, may God bless the reading uh, of his word. Now, In the previous church, the letter that we read the previous church, it was the 
of the church in Ephesus, and that particular church did not have one flaw. That church did not have one deficiency that Jesus spoke about. Not one. Now, once again, when we when you come away reading the previous letter, you, you say that there must be a perfect church out there. No, there are no perfect churches because, once again, as we did say, uh, every church is comprised of imperfect people. So, therefore, there are no perfect churches. No perfect churches. But, but, however, it is how they did what they did. It was the things that they put first. It was how they did the things that they were doing that caused Jesus to say, they have it right. They have it right. But here, in this particular church, as we go through it, we see that these individuals were confused and they were compromising. Confused and compromising. Let's go through it. It says here, in verse number 12, once again, to the angel. And we cannot stress enough that when Jesus says he's talking to the angel, he's talking to the pastor, he's talking to the leader of the church. The pastor is... The, the pastor is the head of the church. The pastor is the, the pastor is, he sets the tone for the church. The pastor himself. And so whatever direction the pastor goes in is the direction that the church goes in. And so that always needs to be brought to fore. However the pastor goes is how that church goes. Here we see he's writing to the church in Pergamos, to the angel, to the pastor, and Jesus identifies himself as the one who has the sharp sword with two edges. If you know anything about Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, you know that he's talking about the word of God. The Bible says that the word of God is quick. In other words, alive and sharp. And, and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it's the two-edged sword that he's speaking about. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, he talks about the two-edged sword which, which comes from his mouth. Once again, it's talking about judgment. But it's also talking about it's the word of God that's going to bring judgment. God will judge things through his word. And that is what he is going to end up doing here. As he says in five out of the seven letters, he says in verse number 13, I know your works. He knows the works of those that are working for him. He knows the works of those who are not working for him. He knows everyone's works. So he says... I know your works. I know where you are. I know where you dwell. I know where you are situated. He says, even where Satan's seat is, they were in a place, Pergamus, and we're not going to get into, into the geographical outline uh, of where uh, this particular church was, but they were in a place where Satan had set up shop. Satan was, was, was in control of this particular area. There was, there was uh, uh, history tells us that there was a, a throne, that there was a seat, a literal throne and seat, a statue to, to some false god that was in this place called Pergamos. And people gave obeisance to it. They worshipped it. And so Jesus says, I know where you are. I know where you are. I know that you are in the midst of of corruption. But how will you live? How will you choose to live if you are living in the midst of corruption? I mean, there is evil here. There's evil there. There's evil everywhere you go, everywhere you turn. How will you live? What do you do? What do you do? Well, he wants them to overcome, as he says in the Latin, in, our, in verse number 17. But here he says, I know where you, where you dwell, you dwell in a place where Satan, his influence is strong. It's mighty. And thou holdest fast my name. Number one, there were some very, very good things about this particular church. He says, you are holding tight to my name. You're not letting go of my name. You're talking about his name, you're talking about the authority that is in his name. Anytime we say in Jesus' name, we are talking about by the authority of the name of Jesus. So he says, you're holding firm to that. You're not letting go. You know who I am. You know what I can do. You understand my power. 
You have that much right. You are holding firm to my name. That name above all names. That name where under heaven whereby all men must be saved. You, you, you're holding firm to my name. But he says here, you also have not denied my faith. My faith. The faith that has to be in Christ. You have not denied it. You have not, you have not, you have not turned your faith away to something else. So you have, you have these things going for you. And this is not a bad thing. This is good. Jesus is commending them. He is commending them. I, 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 I love what you're doing. Holding fast to my name. And not denying the faith. This is good. And he says, he goes on to say that in the days where Antipas was my faithful martyr. There was a martyr. There was a witness. There was someone who had more than likely died for his stance. He says, Antipas was one of you. And there may be other Antipases among you. He says, this is good. He says, my faithful martyr or witness. He was faithful because he stood firm. He held on to his name. He held on to his faith. And he paid the price for it. He says he was slain. Obviously. He said he was slain. He was slain. Among you. Where Satan dwells. Where Satan dwells. This man Antipas. And this is the only place where we see this man. He's not talking about Herod Antipas. That we read about in the Bible. In the New Testament. No. This is an individual who was a child of God. Who stood firm until the end. But he was in a place where Satan dwelled and he paid for it with his life. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to take a stand. Sometimes you're going to have to stand up for what you believe. And sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to pay a price for standing up for what you believe. We have not seen, we have not seen persecution here in the United States the way people are persecuted in other parts of the world. We don't know here in America anything about true persecution. You don't have to worry about saying Jesus' name on the street. You have the freedom to say Jesus' name on the street corner. Anytime. You can go on a bus. You can go on a train. You can go on an airplane. Now, then people might shout you down. People might call you crazy. People might curse you out. All of those things might happen. But in other countries, if you whisper the name of Jesus... You can lose your life. Literally lose your life. They can snatch you off the corner and nobody will ever see you again. So we really don't understand how blessed we are here. Compared to the rest of the world. But here we see that this man Antipas took a chance. I use that phrase, taking a chance. But he lifted up the name of Jesus. He would not back away from lifting up the name of Jesus. And he was killed. He was killed. Verse number 14. Jesus now is going to lay out his case against them. You got some good things going on. Very good things. But you got some bad things going on too. Here's where you're going to here's where you're going to see the dichotomy, the dichotomy of this particular church in Pergamos. With as good as the commendations are that Jesus gives them. Because these commendations are great. The, I don't know how these commendations, you cannot get much better than that. That you that you hold firm to my name. And that you do not deny the faith. And that there are even those among you that have paid for it dearly with their lives. I mean, Jesus is commending them. These these are wonderful traits or characteristics of an individual or of a church. That they stand firm and are not moved by anything. Even in the midst of Satan's seat. Where Satan dwells. But he says, I got some things against you though. I got some things against you. He says, he says church. He says, 
you have there them that hold the doctrine, them that there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And let me go on, let me go on. He says, they hold the doctrine of, 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 of Balaam and who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Verse number 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which think I hate. So here was a church. Here was a church that had it together. Here was a church that was holding firm to the name of Jesus. Here was a church where people, where the, at least an individual had died for holding firm to the name of Jesus and not denying the faith. But yet, Jesus says, you have some people in there. You have some folks in your, in your midst that are teaching some bad things. And the things that they're teaching are leading the people into immorality and idolatry. And Jesus says, this is not good. You see, they were confused. You see, you see, they, this church, Pergamus, they were guilty. They were guilty of trying to please society around them rather than please the Lord. In spite, in spite of the good things that they had done. In spite of being firm in the faith. In spite of not denying the faith, in spite of holding firm to his name, in spite of all of those things, yet and still they allowed, they allowed bad doctrine. They allowed false teachers to flourish. They allowed false teachers to propagate their poison among them. They gave them a platform to preach, to teach, and they allowed it to go on and on and on they did not correct them they did not they did not point them out they did not warn them and they did not remove them they did nothing they let the false teachers stay in their midst to continue to draw those within to try to draw them away or draw them out you might say hey can't we all get along? Can't we all get along? Let the chips fall where they may. And and he, here's what he listen, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. The wheat and the tares. Yes. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow together. In other words, let those who are saved stay among the rather, let those who are unsaved stay among those who are saved. In the end, Jesus will make the separation. Jesus will make the separation. But Jesus, but, but, but here we're talking about something different. Here we're talking about individuals who are propagating false doctrine among God's people. And the Bible says they ought to be dealt with. They ought to be dealt with. How do you deal with false teachers within the church? What is the scriptural way? What is the Bible way to deal with individuals who come in or who rise up amongst the people and try and lead the people astray. What do you do? What do you do? Just let it go. Somebody got to say something. Somebody has to do something. You just let it go and let people uh, uh, go after it. Because listen, unfortunately, unfortunately, and I've said it and I've said it and I've said it. We are living in a, in, in Christendom. Christians have become scripturally and biblically illiterate. No one sees, knows, understands, or wants to get to know what the Bible says. What the Bible means. Doctrine is old. Doctrine is unnecessary. Doctrine is dry. We don't need all of those things. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's just do what we do and go home and live our lives. It's more than that. There's so much more to it than that. And that can't be how it is. No. Here's, here's, what, here's what the Bible says. When it comes to how to deal with individuals within the church who are spouting or teaching false doctrine. Listen, Paul pointed people out. If you go to 1 Timothy, 
First Timothy, Second Timothy, rather. Second Timothy, chapter number one. Look at the Second Timothy chapter. Let me give you a couple some scriptures that point out the fact that yes, sometimes you have to name names. Sometimes you have to call people out. Some people have. Sometimes you have to point out what people are saying and what they're doing, so that others will be warned. They need to be warned. First Timothy, rather, I'm sorry, Second Timothy, uh, chapter number one. Second Timothy, chapter one, and verse number fifteen. Paul says, "This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me." of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. He says, these two men, they turned their back on me. They turned their back. So he called them out. He, he, he made it a point to let everybody know, so you know, these are the two men. They left. They turned their back. Okay? Calling out names. It's necessary. It's necessary so that people will be warned. So that people will be warned. He goes on in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 17. Let's start in verse number 14 to get the background. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Verse 17, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus, they were spouting false doctrine. And he says that their word was profane and it was vain babblings. But if it was not stopped, it would increase and cause more ungodliness. So Paul is saying, here's who they are. These two men. These two men. Chapter number three, once again, right here in 2 Timothy, chapter three and verse eight. He makes a point even to go back in time. He goes back through history and names the name of two individuals, of individuals that we see in the Old Testament who dealt with Moses. And here, Paul reveals their names for us through the Spirit of God because the Old Testament doesn't tell us who they were. We're talking about, we're talking about the snake. And we're talking about, we're talking about uh, Moses' rod which turned into a snake. We're talking about these magicians who also had rods that turned into snake, but uh, Moses' rod overpowered them. Here's what he says in verse number 8, chapter 3, verse 8, 2 Timothy. Now as Jonas and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Once again, he's talking about false teachers, but he brings up the names of Jonas and Jambres. Two men from the Old Testament. He called them out. He called them out. But he says, these men, these false teachers now, they are just like them. They are just like them. They are corrupt. They are reprobate concerning the faith. And they resist the truth. That's a false teacher. That's a false teacher spreading false doctrine. He goes on. He goes on in chapter 4. Once again, in chapter 4, verse number 10. He names names. He says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. But he says, Demas has forsaken me. He left. He's not with me anymore. Forsaken. He didn't leave to go home to visit his family. Forsake means that you left somebody flat. I'm with you now. I'm gone. I'm out. I'm not with you anymore. But he names his name. See, he wasn't trying to he wasn't trying to spare feelings. He wasn't trying to not say people's names so that people would not get hurt. It was not his intention to hurt people. It was not his intention to to to, to cause any kind of problem or trouble. He was simply letting people know that these individuals were dangerous because of the things that they said and the things that they were doing and had done. They were dangerous. And he calls them out. Finally, in chapter number 4, in verse number 14, once again, Paul speaking to Timothy, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Hey, 
He says, that man, Alexander, he did me wrong. And the Lord is going to take care of him for what he did. The Lord, not me. I'm not wishing nothing bad on him. I'm not praying for revenge. The Lord reward him according to his works. But he called him out. Alexander, he didn't say, listen, I don't want to say his name, but... I don't I don't want to I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to mention names, but no, he called his name out. Because it was necessary that they know who the individual was that was causing problems. And let's wrap this up. Let, let's let's go. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter number 16 and verse number 17. Once again, we're talking about we're talking about how do you deal? How do you deal with false teachers? How do you deal with false teachers? How do you deal with individuals uh, within the church who rise up and start spouting out wrong teaching? First of all, you got to be able to see false teaching. You got to be able to you got to be able to discern false teaching when you hear it. Okay, if you don't if you don't read the word yourself, then you're never going to understand when you hear false doctrine, when you hear false teaching. You're going to hear and you're going to think it's right because you don't know any better. You need to know better. You need to read for yourself and don't believe everything that you hear. Do not accept everything that you see. Once again, the Spirit of God in you, if you're really a child of God, the Spirit of God in you is going to let you know that this is good and He's going to let you know if it's not right. He will let you know. You will know. That's called discernment. Romans chapter 16, verse number 17. It says, now I beseech you, brethren. So he's talking to brothers and sisters. He's talking to fellow Christians here. He says, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. You can't, that's it. So Paul named names. And Paul also said, listen, mark them. That means keep a close eye. Keep them within your sight. Keep a close eye on those who cause divisions and offenses against or contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. In other words, if they depart from doctrine, from proper doctrine, if they begin teaching false things, Keep your eye on them and avoid them. Leave them alone. Don't give them a platform. Do not give them a platform. Don't give them your ear. That's the Bible way. That's the Bible way. It goes on to say, Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, dealing with the false teacher, dealing with the false teacher. Now remember, this church this church in Pergamos, they were, they were confused. Because even though they had these good things happening for them, that Jesus commends, that they were faithful, that they were holding firm to his name, still they were allowing this bad teaching to go on. They were allowing it to flourish. Two different, uh, two different uh, uh, versions of false teachers were there. You had... Uh, those who taught the doctrine of Balaam and those who were holding uh, to the doctrine of uh, the Nicolaitans. Now, they were holding, this This word, the, when the Bible talks about the fact that they were holding firm to to his name, it means that they were, that they were holding, that they were holding tight. They were holding his name tightly. That, that That's what it means to be hold, to take, it means to take a hold of with force and hold on with strength. To hold on to without any intention of letting go. I have this, I'm holding it, I'm not letting it go. That's how they were holding to his name. That's how we have to hold on to his name. But these individuals, these individuals who are holding the doctrine of Balaam and holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, they were holding what they believed in the same way that the Christians were holding on to Jesus' name. They had no intention of letting go. They were, took it by force, and they were holding it with strength because they believed it, and they were teaching it. And the B 
people in Pergamos were giving them a platform to preach and to spread it more. So they were confused and they were compromising because they didn't want to hurt feelings. They didn't want to, they didn't want to say, listen, you, 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 this, you're wrong. They didn't want to say, listen, you're out of order. They didn't want to do anything to offend. But that's one of the problems that we have in the church today. We don't want to offend, so we don't preach about certain things. Certain things we will not preach about because we don't want we don't want to talk about the blood. We don't want to talk about the cross. We don't want to talk about sin because people will become offended. People have to get offended because you must not stop preaching the full counsel of God's word. This is where Pergamus was stumbling. In spite of all the good that they were, in spite of those good characteristics, they were still letting false doctrine go. Because they wanted to please people. They wanted to pander people. They didn't want to hurt anybody. Here's what it says in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. Colossians 2.8 says, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So, we read from the book of Romans, how do you deal with false teachers? Number one, you got to mark them. Mark them. See, there he goes. That That's the one right there. That's the one that's teaching. That's the one that's, that's him. That's him. And then, mock them, avoid them. Here it says, beware of them. Beware of them which seek to spoil you. That word spoil, that word spoil, it's talking about stealing, snatching, taking away. Beware of those who seek to take away what you have. Beware of those who seek to remove from you the truth that you know. See, that's why you have to be totally and utterly, completely convinced of the truth. No one should be able to come along and tell you something and snatch away the truth from you. Provided what you believe is true. No one should be able to do that. Here's what it says. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 11. It says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them or expose them or rebuke them. See, we don't want to do that anymore. No one wants to be rebuked. And so the church does not rebuke anyone. The church will not tell anyone, no, you can't do that. Certain things do not go just because it's a church. Just because it's God's house does not mean that everything goes. But we're in God's house and we're worshiping God and we're praising God. Just because you're in God's house and worshiping God and praising God does not mean that whatever you do goes. No, everything does not go. We have to remain within the parameters of Scripture. If we go outside the parameters, if we go outside the lines of Scripture, then we err. We do the wrong thing. We are going backwards. We do not want to step outside of the circle of His grace. We do not want to step outside of the circle of grace because when we step outside of the circle of grace, we enter into law. And this is what you do not want to do. So therefore, it's necessary to worship and praise God. Here's, here's the word I'm going to use intelligently we have to learn to worship the Lord intelligently listen and all that means is yes the Bible says love the Lord with all your heart with your soul with all your mind and I believe that we ought to praise him in the same way with all our heart with all our soul all of our mind with all of our spirit praise him praise him but do it intelligently okay if you are if, if you run afoul of the Spirit of God, if you trample over, if you go over or go beyond what the Spirit of God says is proper, 
you're stepping out of line. You just can't do what comes to your head because you think that you are in the spirit because you're in that moment. Everything does not go. Everything does not go. Church should not be a place where there church should be a place where there is fire. So when the fire of God fell. Yes, the fire of God needs to fall. We need the fire. But as a brother said to me years ago, there should not be wildfire. No wildfire. Fire, but not wildfire. A controlled fire. Not fire that is just all over the place. No. Fire from the Lord. Fire. His fire. That's what we need. His fire. So it's important to understand that everything does not go. Now we see here in Ephesians chapter 5, once again, how do you deal with false teachers? Listen, the unfruitful works of darkness, one of the unfruitful works of darkness are the works that are being accomplished by those who teach false doctrine. It is a work of darkness because they are doctrines of demons. False doctrines are doctrines of demons. Now listen, there are doctrines that are that someone has misunderstood something that has been said from the Bible and it's a misunderstanding and you can bring them the, the truth and correct them and they will straighten themselves out. But there's something called pride. Uh, when, there, when there is teaching and false teachers involved and teachers involved in general, teachers are very, very proud and will not back away from what they have said because they believe that they're right. They believe that they're right. So it's very hard to get through to someone who thinks that they're right. Very hard. Very difficult. And so it's necessary, it's necessary that we do not have fellowship. What did we say? What did we say from uh, Romans chapter 16 and verse number 17? He said, avoid them which cause division among you. Avoid them. If they teach contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, avoid them. Here, he says, expose them. Expose them. Okay? Don't have fellowship with them. Don't entertain them. Don't give them a platform. Don't allow them to flourish. He says, rebuke them. Expose them. Show them to the world they're teaching wrong. Show them to the church they're teaching wrong. That's what he says. So it must be done. That's how you deal. That's how you deal with those who are teaching false doctrine. And this is not what the church in Pergamos was doing. The church in Pergamos was not doing this. Uh, the church, the church in Pergamos, the church in Pergamos instead let them go. They compromise the truth by letting the lie flow. Even though they had a strong stance on the truth, even though they understood, this makes it worse. Because you understand the truth. You understand the power in my name. You understand what it means to, to, to stand firm and let nothing move you. You understand what it means. And you should be the last one to allow false doctrine to run its course. Don't let it run its course. Don't let it run. Don't let it go. So this is why Jesus tells them that you're holding firm. And he tells them in verse number 16, he says, repent. You got to turn around. You got to turn around. You got to fix this. Okay. He says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He says, I'm gonna, if you don't do something about it, then I'm going to come and I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Once again, we talked about the sword. In verse number 12, he says, I'm the one with the two-edged sword. The sword in his mouth, from his mouth is the word of God. He's going to judge them by and through and with his word. His word 
coming from him is going to bring all correction. It's going to bring judgment. It's going to set everything straight. But he says, you need to do it. You do it. You know the right way. But since you haven't, if you don't repent, if you don't turn around and do what you're supposed to do, then I will come and I will do it the way I do it. You see, I'd rather do it. I'd rather do it myself. If I know the good to do and do not do it, the Bible says it is sin. And this is where the church in Pergamos was. They knew the good to do, but they were not doing it. And Jesus calls them to turn around. Turn around, he says. He says, if, he says, uh, if you have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says, if you overcome, you're going to eat the hidden manna. He's given them a stone. And in that stone, he says, it's going to be a new name written, a name which no man knoweth except the one who receives it. That's what we can look forward to. It's a general, it's a general thing that's going to happen, I believe, to all of us, not just the people from Pergamos. We're all going to have this stone, I believe. But it's so important. The lesson tonight is don't allow false doctrine to flourish. Don't be like the church in Pergamos. Don't allow it to confuse you. Don't become confused. And don't compromise. Don't compromise. Now remember, every church is made up of individuals. Individuals in the church had decided to take this route. Okay, the church is a group of people. And these people decided that this is how we're going to deal with with the situation with those who are teaching the doctrine of Balaam and those who are teaching the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This is how we're going to deal with them. We know that we know that we believe this way and just let them believe the way they believe and just let it go. Jesus says no. No. In this case, you do not allow the wheat and the tares to grow together. As we said, this is a totally different animal here. These individuals are promoting false teaching, infecting, infecting those in the body who are weak, infecting those in the body who don't know, infecting those in the body who do not understand false doctrine when they hear it and they eat it up and they take it and they run with it thinking that they have gotten it now and they don't. They don't have it. We must, as we read, we must beware. We must mark them. We must avoid them. And we must reprove them. I'm going to say it again. How do you deal with false teachers? Mark them. Avoid them. Beware of them, reprove them, expose them. And we have this mandate throughout the New Testament. Well, especially here in the book of 2 Timothy, where Paul names names. He named the names of those who had done him wrong. He had named the names of those who turned their back. He named the names of those who were teaching and promoting false doctrine. He named names. You know, he did not just give a description. He did not just say there are a couple of people over there, and I'm, I'm sure you know who they are, but it's a couple of people over there that are teaching wrong. He didn't say there's a couple of people. No, he said their names. He called them out. And so it's necessary that the body knows where there is error so that we can Beware and avoid and do not give them a platform. We must do it. If not, the church, the church will be run over and taken over by individuals who 
don't have and don't know the truth. Much of, not all of, of course, of course, a lot of today's youth are being brought up on things that are that have nothing to do with living the life of the Christian. Many, many in churches today are doing things and settling for things because they don't know any better. And it's going to take time to unlearn these things. But they're being, they're being sold. They're being sold in many, at many times they're being sold a false it's wrong, it's wrong, it's false. It's not going to help them, it's not going to benefit them, it's not going to help them to live the life they need to live. The devil is real. As it says here, this church in Pergamos, they were, they, were, they were living, they were in Satan's seat where Satan dwells. And you may be in a place where Satan dwells where it seems like the devil is just here because there's so much corruption, so much crime, so much evil all around. I am in Satan's seat. He is just, he is just, he is just set up camp here. And you need a Christianity that is going to strengthen and empower you to stand up against the enemy. You need your faith put in the right place. In the right place. Not in things. Of course not in people. Not in objects. No. You, you, don't, need, you don't need that type of thing. You need your faith in Christ. Period. Faith in Christ. Understand that what he has done is what, is what gives you victory. Not anything else. Not anything else brings victory. Nothing else. Nothing else gives you victory. Except Jesus. That's it. And that's where your faith has to be. I know many say, well, my faith is in Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. I trust him. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then they go and they use or promote something else that is going to give them victory at the same time. You cannot have Christ giving you victory and something else giving you victory at the same time. Only Christ. It's only Christ and what he accomplished at the cross. Not anything else. Not anything else. Not a prayer shawl. Not a prayer cloth. Not if it's over your head, not, it's, not if it's over your shoulders, not if you tie it up on your back. Nothing else is going to give you victory. That piece of cloth is not a shield. It's not going to protect, it's not going to hold you. Nothing. It's not going to release you from bondage. It's not going to give you victory over sin. It's going to do nothing for you. Nothing. If you blow on it, if you Dip it in water. If you sprinkle it with water, it means nothing. Nothing. Only faith in Christ and what he has done. That's it. That's your victory. That's your victory. That's where your victory is. That's it. Anything else? It's a slap in the face of Jesus. Anything else, it's spiritual adultery. Yes, in Jesus' name, but this. Yes, in Jesus' name, but that. No. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name alone. We need to keep our faith locked in. Locked in to Jesus. Let's understand. Let's learn tonight. Let's learn tonight that we need to hold firm to his name. We need to hold firm to the faith. Not deviate. Not deviate from faith in Christ and Christ alone. Beware of false teachers. Avoid false teachers. 
Mark false teachers. Expose false teachers. That's it. We do this. We do it the Bible way. We don't want to go in another direction. Not another direction. Maybe you're listening. Maybe you're watching. And there has been compromise in your life. Maybe you've compromised the word. Maybe when you go to work. Maybe when you go to school. Maybe even when you go to church. Maybe even when you're at the house. There's compromise going on. We don't want to compromise. We want to stand firm. We want to stand firm. We want to stand firm and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Avoid them. Expose them. Lord, I pray that you will give us the strength, Lord Jesus, not to compromise. Give us the strength, Lord, to hold firm to your name as those in Pergamos did. Give us the strength to stand firm and let nothing move us. Lord, help us to stand firm in the faith, Lord Jesus. Lord, even if it comes to us receiving bodily harm, Lord, let us stand firm for the faith, as those in Pergamos did. But Lord, let us remain faithful to you, and let us not give ear to those who would choose to teach false doctrine. Lord, let us stand fast, stand firm in the word of God and what it says, and keep our faith and our hope in you and what you have done. Lord, have your way. Bless us right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We want to bless the Lord and we thank him. We thank him once again for his word. His word is unshakable. His word His word will stand. Though, though everything may fall, his word is going to stand. No matter what goes on, no matter what happens, you can serve God. Yes, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in the midst of corruption, even living in the place where Satan dwells, you can live a victorious life in Christ. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I say we can be perfect, but you can live a victorious Christian life, not allowing sin to dominate you. Yes, you can. Put your faith, put your trust, put your hope in Christ and Christ alone. Alone. Amen. Amen. We bless his name. We bless his name. We're here every Tuesday night at this time with a Bible study that we pray will be beneficial and helpful for your Christian life. The Bible Speaks Live is a production of That's the Word Ministries. You can go to our website. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can go to Spreaker.com. You'll find all of our podcasts there. Uh, I'm sure you'll be blessed uh, if you do that. Uh, once again, we exist to help the body of Christ grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. This is our mandate. This is our call. This is what we do. We just want to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord with a distinctly cross-centered message. It's all about the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's where we come from. And that's why we are here. Every blessing comes from the cross directly. Amen. So we thank you for watching. We thank you for listening. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. Don't forget, tomorrow night we'll be right back here with the Cutting It Right Wednesday night Bible study. Another riveting Bible study uh, that we know will be beneficial also. And that will help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Until then, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. We'll see you next time. May God bless you.